You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcast on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for October 9th, 2020. It's not safe for work. Coming to you live from the Cornfield Resistance, where our local congressional race has become national news, it's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. everybody. How are you doing today? Uh, today, we found out this morning, listening to morning prayer from Canterbury Cathedral. Like you do, like uh, liberals like do, do every day all around the world. <laughs> Anglican <laughs> services from Canterbury Cathedral. Sure. Via YouTube. Via yeah. YouTube. Uh-huh. Uh, today is World Post Day, celebrating yes. the international postal services of the world. And yes. so... We want to start off our show by saying happy World Post Day and go Postal Unions. Go Postal unions. unions, baby. Go Postal Unions. Who knew that going postal would eventually mean saving democracy? That's right. Yep. That's right. And so uh, a perfect dovetail to that is that uh, we have decided this week that in three weeks from today. Three weeks. O- three weeks. October 30th. Yes. Which is the last podcast before Election Day. That is true. We are going to have a letter show, and yes. there we are going to be reading from your letters. So we need your cards and letters and emails. And let me give everyone that information now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is uh, Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. You can email us at proleftpodcast at gmail.com. That email goes to both of us. Mm-hmm. And put in the subject line of your email letters show so that we know that that's what you're writing about. And October 30th is another important day in history. It is Drift Glass's 60th birthday. Yes, it is. So you can include a birthday card for Drift Glass if you wish. Mm-hmm. Uh, Drift Glass isn't big on birthdays. No. but I, I'm uh, turning 60, but on, on the inside, I'm 95. Oh. <laughs> I think after this year, after this week, <laughs> we've know. all aged about I five know. years, honestly. And I'm still two weeks ahead of my brother. So my younger brother's birthday is tomorrow, actually. Happy um, birthday to your bro. He's such parents, a sweetheart. Those parents of ours got busy during February. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I don't want to think about it. I really don't want to think about it. But Valentine's it's Day babies. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So. Uh, yeah, his birthday is is today, uh, tomorrow actually. Happy birthday to my younger brother, who's a better man than I will ever be. He's he's got a lot going for him. He's a wonderful guy. We love him very much. He's great. And yeah. happy birthday. Yeah, and you have to know him and to know me, and one day you all will uh, to know what a miracle it is that the person I knew when he was seventeen, eighteen, nineteen is the guy I know now. Yeah, it is. You not... guys both turned out to be family men, which yeah. is hilarious, given your. <laughs> Dirty, dirty past. Your I've mother had we, a we great deal of faith. <laughs> yes. My, our mother believed in us far beyond our, our worth to be believed in. <laughs> and uh, and I was going to be, you know, dead by 30. I mean, that was my yeah. big plan. So the rest has just been gravy. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So happy birthday to my younger bro, Larry. So where would you like to start, Blue Gal? Today, um, we have a long topic, a fairly singular topic that um, we'd like to dig right into. Yeah. And, and I think it's... It's good for us to sort of soften the focus because there is such a fire hose of crap coming from Donald Trump. Yeah. And oh, yeah, uh, it's it's only going to get worse as the election approaches. Mm-hmm. And some of it is, uh, yeah, we're not going to give amplification to no. a lot of nonsense. No. Some of it is absolutely terrifying. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, threats of violence in fundraising emails. I find that terrifying. Yeah. Uh, But uh, we're going to soften the focus a little bit today because alert listener Kevin Holtzinger asked us a question. And it's a question that we just thought, wow, that we could really go 45 minutes on this question. It's a good question. Uh, It's a big question. So why don't you go ahead and explain what Kevin's uh, question is? Yeah, well, uh, two things. This is a dog that did not bark in the night question. It's something that its absence is overwhelmingly obvious evidence of something that has changed radically. And that reference is from uh, The Silver Blaze. It's a Sherlock Holmes story uh, about Mm -hmm. a racehorse. But in the story, 
Um, the evidence that a crime had taken place was the fact that the dog didn't bark in the night. Therefore, the dog, a guard dog, which barked all the time at everyone, must have known the people who'd come in and messed with the horse. Mm -hmm. And everyone mm -hmm. else was looking for 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 actual evidence. And Sherlock Holmes was smart enough to look for the absence of something. And the second thing you need to know is a, a, a term of art that we on the left use and have been using for a very long time um, called tone policing mm -hmm. um, or tone copying um, or, or courtesy class. It's where you can't deny what liberals are saying is true because it is. And it is too embarrassing to admit that liberals actually know what the fuck they're talking about because that would make you look stupid and make your entire profession look stupid and basically unravel the entire pundit class of the American media. So how do you deal with someone who's manifestly right about everything when admitting that is destructive to your profession and your, and your person? And the answer is you attack how they say things. You say, well, maybe torture is bad. But the way you're saying torture is bad really puts me off. And I really can't deal with your uncivil tone. The incivility of the liberal language. It's, it's really about how you put things, Blue Gal. And boy, oh boy, have we been getting a lot of that over the last, well, ever since I started blogging and long before that, you notice it. It's just the go-to area denial weapon of the mainstream media and has been for a long time. Well, and definitely since the Iraq war, since yeah. blogging started and people use the F word on the Internet to describe the Bush administration, you had the dean, the Washington Post columnist. Well, yeah, David uh, Broder. David Broder call us the vituperative foul mouthed bloggers of the left. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, you know, it was terrible that you were yeah. using the F word. How dare you? Yeah. How so dare you? You swear, you know, keep keep the tone of your discourse at a professional level, please. And that's because the mainstream media only loses their mind when liberals punch back. Right. You can have Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity on the radio calling us and Ann Coulter and all the rest of the horribles calling us everything but a child of God every fucking day for decades. And it doesn't rise to the level of the attention of the mainstream media. But when liberals punch back, that's, oh, my God, the incivility. Why are you people so angry all the time? And that's how you keep them in check, because you put every liberal into an impossible situation. If you approach the discussion, a knife fight, really, uh, in, a tr in, in, a, in, a, in tone of civility and compromise, you have the Obama administration, which tried that for eight fucking years. And it didn't work because the right cannot be compromised with because they're fucking insane. So – if you try to deal with this on a calm, rational, let's all sit and reason together level, you're going to get bulldozed and no one in the media will pay any attention to the fact that you're right. If, however, you raise your voice, oh, we, you, lo you lose your place at the table automatically because you're not civil. Because you you know, language like that, people like that, that kind of behavior is not allowed in the charm circle of the mainstream media. So that's never mind. Never mind that Donald Trump sa said fucking and Melania Trump said fucking. You know, this just week. this week. <laughs> this week. And 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 it, in, in Trump's case, it was on the air with Rush Limbaugh, who he, has he been a monster. He cost Rush Limbaugh a fine. Yes, yeah. he did. Yes, which Rush Limbaugh can easily pay with all the yes, blood right. money he's accumulated over the years. Right. So um, alert reader Kevin asks the following very simple question. Do you recall if the Lincoln Project, being comprised of conservatives, has had the tone police called on it like liberals would get if – we said literally exactly the same thing. And that is a wonderful question because it makes you think, well, wait a minute. I, I mean, I know we're all supposed to bow down to the Lincoln Project. I know we're supposed to, you know, never Trumpers are our allies. We can't say anything mean about them, other, even though I do all the time. But it's a dazzling question because when it comes right down to it, the Lincoln Project's ads are nothing more than several decades worth of the liberal critique of conservatism. And they file the serial numbers off and they jazz it up with graphics and with professional video editing. It looks very nice. And they put in lots of ominous or sad music. And that's what Lincoln Project is. It's the liberal critique of conservatism without any acknowledgement liberals exist at all. And any acknowledgement that anything prior to 2016 ever happened. And when you see individual never Trumpers and, and Lincoln Project members like Steve Schmidt or Rick Wilson or Charlie Sykes or Michael Steele make one of the hundreds of appearances they make on cable television or on premium podcasts or on the op-ed page of the New York Times, the way they talk 
And I mean, the, literally the words they use to go after Republicans, often right down to the vocabulary they choose and the cadence of their voice and the sneering dismissal they have of everything, all the people they used to work for, is virtually indistinguishable from the salty language for which the Beltway Media Tone Police publicly flogged the shit out of us dirty, disreputable liberals for decades. So, which, which, in many ways, may be, as you say, the dog that doesn't bark, mm -hmm. may be the key to why the Lincoln Project is successful. That's right. And why they have the seat at the table that they do. The fact that it is Rick Wilson who is allowed to be the sweary anti-Trumper. Mm -hmm. And if you and I do the sweary anti-Trump stuff. Well, you know, that's liberal and it's the, it's the wrong tone and how dare liberals talk that way. You know, liberals always talk that way so we can dismiss them. But if Rick Wilson, who is the sweariest, as we learned in a very interesting New Yorker article on the Lincoln Project, which you can find online, we will link it at our blogs. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a long profile. Yeah, it's the main story. It's the it's main, the main story. story. In this about the Lincoln Project. About the Lincoln Project. The fact that it's a former Republican mm -hmm. and it is a Beltway insider mm -hmm. and is someone who had a lot of cred in Washington, D.C. Friends. With friends. 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 And, and, mm -hmm. and, and he's not afraid to make enemies also. I think, I think we are uh, – we need to caution ourselves not to get too obsessed with – Rick Wilson and, and no, company. No, no. He, he, he can fly the Confederate flag. there are other flag. dangers out there. <laughs> he, he can fly the Confederate flag all he wants on his private yeah. property and then right. bitch about Republicans flying the Confederate flag uh, in a commercial and right. be absolutely sure that no one but a bunch of liberals are going to mention that fact and wonder why the fuck no one else is talking about it. Right. But proceed. But, yeah. So th the reason that they are not toned policed has everything to do with what they are both willing to say and willing to leave out yes. of their conversation. Yes, absolutely. And what they are willing to leave out of their conversation is Republicans before 2015. Yes, yes. Uh, their argument is that no one knew, no one could have predicted that Donald Trump would corrupt the Republican Party to the extent that he has. It was unknowable, Blue Gal. No one could have known. And um, says the guy who worked to get Sarah Palin to a debate. <laughs> yes. Yes. No one could yes. have possibly known. Um, and at this point, uh, we're going to refer back to the New York article in just a second. But I'd like to refer us over to another post in which it, Anand Giriaratis and Sarah Kenzior, the inimitable Sarah Kenzior, who has a, a blog and, and has a, a sterling media reputation and is like 100 miles away from us in, uh, from us in St. Louis. They had a, where, a very uh, in-depth conversation, which um, Anand wrote up, and there are a couple of key quotes that really do resonate with me, and I think they resonate with you, too, and probably with a lot of our listeners. Mm -hmm. um, the first is, and I, I truly believe this myself, I don't care much about how I'm portrayed because my work speaks for itself, and I speak for myself. I've never had to retract anything or apologize for a bad prediction. I'm a careful researcher, and I only present information or hypotheses when I'm reasonably confident that I'm right. And this I, is Sarah Kenzior talking. This is Sarah Kenzior right. talking. I think the fact that I got every major thing right is less interesting than the question of why all the people who got nearly everything wrong still have jobs. Gosh, that sounds like somebody I sleep with. That sounds a lot like somebody <laughs> I sleep with, too. Are we sleeping with the same people, Blue Gal? Because I, I want to know. I'd like, I'd like further information on this subject. Um, and the second, it's a long article and we'll, we'll put the link up for it. But the second quote is even more interesting to me than the first, because it really does talk about why this is happening. Why can't these people acknowledge that liberals even exist and that we were talking about this and warning these very people about this very thing before, mm -hmm. actually before 2018. Cause mm -hmm. you remember we had, we flipped the house in 2018 with no help at all from the Lincoln Project because the Lincoln Project didn't exist until didn't 2019. Exist. This is this is why we were crying on on election eve 2016. Right, right. because this yeah. is this we is how knew bad that it, our country was in an extraordinarily dark place. Yes, and yeah. other people did not. Right, and um, there's a a long uh, interchange in this post by 
uh, Anand with him and Joe Scarborough mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. in, I think, December of 2016, around Thanksgiving or whatever. And Anand is saying, I'm really worried. I'm really scared. And, and Scarborough is saying, well, who's being hysterical now? Yeah, don't worry who, about who's it. Who's being alarmist now? This is Joe Scarborough, who apparently founded the revolution, the resistance single-handedly, has been <laughs> leading it ever since. And liberals, once again, do not exist in his universe. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is the second quote by Ms. Kenzior. But it's important for some people to pretend my work doesn't exist because, as I said before, they need to feign shock to dodge accountability. And I destroy the plausibility of shock. They can never say no one could have seen this coming because I saw it coming and I documented it ceaselessly. Once right. again, sounds like someone I've been sleeping with for a very long time. <laughs> and it sounds a lot like people who read my blog and read Crooks and Liars right. and who listen to this podcast. And it has always been vexing to, to, to wonder why, oh, why these people get away with it. And the answer is very simple. Um, they get away with it because they are media insiders. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. the oldest expression in the liberal lexicon from, I believe, Digby is a Yokiar. It's okay yeah, yeah. if you're a Republican. So that, that, that wasn't, that was uh, Duncan Black. I'm sorry, Duncan Black. Well, I'm not on his blog. We are blog. aware of all internet traditions. I'm not on his, <laughs> on his blog roll, so fuck Duncan Black. That's what I said. <laughs> Were um, you deleted from his blog roll? Are no, you I was that never at it. He, he, okay. He would not, okay. he refused to put me on there. I was. I was uh, I was cast out in, into the darkness. Gosh, um, we should bring back blog roll amnesty day. We but really anyway, should. so <laughs> so if you think about it from just the perspective of language, which is what tone police are interested in, it's all they care about, according to them. The only substantive difference between us and the Lincoln Project is that in the history of the world, no vituperative foul mouth blogger on the left has ever been given the millions of dollars in free airtime. And glowing free book reviews and glowing podcast reviews and the rest of the primping and pimping that the media has been handing out to never Trumpers like fucking Mardi Gras beads. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you got to ask yourself, since the media has embiggened these vituperative foul mouthed messengers on the right, the Lincoln Project, like given them a platform that's 10,000 times larger than any dirty, disreputable liberal blogger could ever have dreamed about. Would it be fair to assume or to deduce that the same tone police would be landing on those guys in the Lincoln Project with both feet, maybe 10,000 times harder than they ever stomped on any liberal, right? I mean, that only makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then I went and used my Google skills and my Twitter skills to do a search of the most infamous Beltway tone police to find out what sort of beat down they were meeting out to the Lincoln Lincoln project and the never Trumpers. Cause they, man, they beat the shit out of liberals. They must be going to town on the people using the same language that they stole from us. Right. Right. So I go, (laughs) so I go to Michael Smirconish who has, who has a cottage industry in doing this sort of thing. Not a fucking word. Mm -hmm. Then I go to David Brooks, not a word. Right. Tom Friedman, not a word. Ross Duthat, did write one critical thing about one member of the Lincoln Project, and that was Stuart Stevens. Ah. But it had nothing to do with the language he uses or the critiques or the tactics of their ad campaign. It's because Stuart Stevens, his take on the GOP is roughly my own, which is they've been a mob of bigots and imbeciles and grifters who never believed a fucking thing they've ever, be- they've ever preached for decades. Mm-hmm. And that freaks Ross Duthat out. Yeah. So it's, it's the actual act of remembering the past that he objects to vigorously – and not anything to do with the language, you know, their, their foul mouthness, the use of naughty language and the salty attacks they make on Republicans. So what about Brett Stevens, who apparently has a lot of time on his hands and can chase down stories about phantom Trump lesbians in New York endlessly? <laughs> yes. And who is, a, is an old school tone policer? Not a fucking word from him. What about reliable beltway stalactite Michael Gerson? Nothing. What about Joe Scarborough? And – my note to myself is, you must be fucking kidding me. Morning Joe is practically a daily Lincoln Project fundraiser. Mm-hmm. By the way, the Lincoln Project has raised $70 million. By the way, they are getting checks from Rob Reiner and Goldie Hawn and Bob Carey. There are millionaire fundraisers writing them in single check more money than you and I will ever see from anything we do. All by taking everything that we have been saying for decades, pretending we do not exist, and then making ads out of that language and those attack angles. 
Um, what about Kathleen Parker? Nothing. What about Jennifer Rubin? Are you fucking kidding me? Jennifer Rubin bakes them cookies. Um, Peggy Noonan. Well, honestly, the only time Peggy Noonan has ever pulled her nose out of the brandy snifter and noticed the Lincoln lads was that one weird thing she wrote about how burning the Republican Party down would damage the country. And by the way, those who say that it should happen should have some blame for this president because they refused to take him seriously uh, early on, which is weird when you realize that Peggy Noonan has never acknowledged the Republican Party exists as it actually exists. Right. No, <clears throat> she, she has not. Um, uh, and one I, more. I oh. don't want I don't want this to sound like professional jealousy. It's not. It's no, an analysis no. of where who gets to speak and who doesn't. And how did this happen? How and how did this happen? Is this and, possible? And, and a warning. And I think this is where Sarah, Sarah Kenzior comes in, uh-huh. because this is a warning about the future. Yes. Of our politics. Yes. And that's where it becomes really important. But you had one more thing you wanted to say. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, Matthew Dowd and Ron Fournier, you know, the, the Bobsy twins of the 2016 election, uh, the both siderist Bobsy twins. Who, who, who These are all people who have a vested interest in making sure that there is a tax cutting court stacking Republican Party to talk about right. after Trump. And that liberals like you and I and everyone who listens to this podcast and all the liberals who write their blogs out there um, never, ever are acknowledged for are having – Are permanently marginalized. Because yes. yeah, right. we can't coexist in the same universe. Right, um, right. Matthew Dowd – Because as, we remember the past. Yeah. <laughs> and in this case, Matthew Dowd actually did slander me and slander my readers and block me yeah. for suggesting that both sides do it as a lazy, toxic argument. And four years later, he's saying, these people who are doing all this both sides shit should be ashamed of themselves and stop doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. what does Matthew Daft have to say about the Lincoln Project? Three of these Americans are good friends of mine, and they all love our country and are true patriots. So the, the, fact, of the, the fact of the matter is, before the Never Trumpers began ripping off our liberal critique, the most sacred duty of the Beltway media was to immediately smother any liberal voice critical of the GOP wherever it might crop up, tone police it to death, and bury it under a pile of both sides do it. After and, the never, I'm oh, sorry. I was going to say ahead. after the never Trumpers ripped off decades of liberal critiques and filed it off, it became a very profitable business, remarketing themselves as a as a bunch of noble truth tellers. At which point, the Beltway media almost immediately welcomed them with open arms and open wallets, and the tone police suddenly fell silent and morphed into Lincoln Project cheerleaders, and we inconvenient we inconvenient liberals simply ceased to exist at all. And that's and the- and here's where we start. At least I do mm-hmm. start to get scared. Yes, I start to get scared because of one particular point in the New Yorker article uh-huh. where they're talking about one of the Lincoln Project employees named Ryan Wiggins. It's a woman. Yes. Yeah. Um, Ryan Wiggins, a United Methodist, believes that we are called to love everyone and that supporting Trump perpetuates hate. Mm-hmm. All agreed there. Yep. She told me, the author of this article, that after she became alienated by the Republican Party, she found a new ideological home in the Lincoln Project and now thought of herself as a Lincoln voter. Yeah. In town halls, the founders were coaching Republican supporters on how to persuade fellow conservatives to vote for Biden. In 2017, Schmidt, appearing on a panel, Steve Schmidt, appearing on a panel at the University of Southern California, noted that Ronald Reagan, when running against Jimmy Carter in 1980, didn't attack the Carter voter. He instead created a permissive environment where Democrats could cross back over. <laughs> missing and missing what, one what vital piece. And what she leaves off, yeah, what the yeah. author of this article leaves off, cross back over from what? Mm-hmm. It crossed back over from Richard Nixon uh-huh. and Watergate. Uh-huh. And the fact that Reagan was Nixon's, you know, alternative to the right of Nixon, right? He he was the uh, alternative to Ford right. in 1976 and therefore became the 1980 nominee. Mm-hmm. Um, he allowed Democrats to cross back over to the Republican Party and just erase all memory banks regarding Richard Nixon and the Republican Party. Indeed. And the difference, of course, in these two time periods is there were Republicans willing to tell Richard Nixon, you are 
flat out going to be impeached, going to be removed from office. The votes are there. You've got to resign. And that party is dead. <laughs> yes. The response, the, the res- and, and Nixon, to his credit, respected the Supreme Court, respected the rule of law. When the court subpoenaed his tapes, he turned them over. And so, you know, things are worse than the Nixon years. But at the same time, we are looking at people that I don't trust because what is what is being preserved here by not tone policing the Lincoln Project and by pretending that they are, you know, good moral people saving the republic is a chair is being pulled out for them to have a seat at the table to set policy for Joe Biden. Yes. And therefore rebuild some sort of Lincoln party, which, you know, I'm not terrified of that because I understand who the Republican primary voter is right. far better <laughs> than I think a lot of people do. Yeah. And uh, they won't stand you know, for it. We, well, Drift Glass is going to be Rubio. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely going to be Rubio. It's going to be Rubio. Definitely. Definitely Don't worry. Don't worry. It's going to be Rubio. Well, and and if you dig into the, uh, as we did, into the New Yorker article, Mm -hmm. um, you find that the reason, the reason the Lincoln Project and the Never Trumpers became a necessity to save Mm -hmm. democracy is, and I quote, no group had what Galen called the skills or willingness to fight Trump publicly or to convey explicitly the constitutional danger of a second term. Mm -hmm. Um. Rick Wilson, it, it was just like appalled the Democrats don't have a fighting instinct. Never forget that Trump's team would burn this country to the fucking ground in order to win. They must choose combat over scholarly discourse. This is a chain fight in a biker bar in Frogass, Alabama, which I believe is right down the street from Sisterfuck, Arkansas. And he's right. The, that's the only way to really fight Trump on his own terms and knock him off his game because and, he's the name caller bully. And the point uh, of this being... That this idea that the Democrats just don't have anybody, the left has no one who's capable of, you know, writing scathing op-eds and doing videos and doing graphics and taking them on in kind of the bitter, harsh, truthful, salty language. That they these, have plenty of people. They're called bloggers. Lots, they're called fucking <laughs> bloggers. We've been doing this for decades. And the reason we never got off the ground is because the mainstream media would not tolerate it. Anytime right. a liberal right. stuck their head up, they got their head taken off. Mm-hmm. Anytime anyone mm-hmm. talked about the fact that maybe Meet the Press is fucked up and maybe there's something weird there that they keep having a shitty host who lets Republicans roll over them, that was anathema. That you just – you cannot do it. There are a couple of people in the mainstream media, a couple of people who write like Charlie Pierce, who has nothing nice to say about the Lincoln Project in this article where he's quoted. Mm-hmm. Um but everyone else is just this massive smothering blanket of condescension and censorship and exile for any liberal who dared to do exactly what the Lincoln Project is doing now. And the question then arises, well, what do they have that we didn't have? And the answer is they have a bunch of friends inside the media who are willing to make this bargain, who are willing to give them $70 million to do this thing, which is you're going to go after Trump and we're going to pretend Trump was a fluke. He mm-hmm. was an anomaly. He was a mm-hmm. freak of nature. Mm-hmm. He wasn't the manifestation of the Republican Party, because if that's true, we're all fucking doomed. So you go out there and fight and fight and fight and fight Trump only. The people who support him only, just Lindsey Graham and Donald Trump, that little weird inner circle. We'll get rid of those people. And then we're going to come in with the Lincoln Party. And the Lincoln Party is for all those good Republicans who just didn't know any better and who just got fooled. You know, this is called the Tea Party 2.0. This is the escape hatch. This is the giant right. fucking lifeboat being built right in front of us. And you know what we say? Burn the lifeboats. Burn the fucking lifeboats. And honestly, and, and let's let but let's talk about this in practical terms for a moment. Sure. Because the Lincoln Project has a has sworn or has publicly announced sure. that they are interested in flipping the Senate. Yes. And they are move they are working to flip the Senate not just now, but in twenty twenty two as well. Mm-hmm. So to that, from that standpoint, I applaud them. I absolutely do. Yep. Uh, there are, by the way, 22 Republicans mm-hmm. whose term ends in 2022. 
Mm -hmm. This is what junior dude, my my (laughs) savant son, kept telling me over and over again, mom, mom. It's I it we have to get rid of Trump, but just so that you know, it would be better for the Democratic Senate if Trump was in office in twenty twenty two. And I'm not suggesting that, and he no, wasn't either. No, but he wasn't suggesting that either. But he said, you know, we can't let this uh enthusiasm for voting for Democrats die down in twenty twenty two. We have to keep the fire going because there are so many Republicans up for re election. Uh-huh. And uh, North Carolina Senator Burr and Pennsylvania Senator Toomey have already retired. They are not running for re-election in 2022. So that brings us down to 20 vulnerable Republicans, very mm-hmm. vulnerable because we'll be able to say, you know, the dangerous politics of Donald Trump. They defended that. All of them voted to keep Donald Trump in office. They have to wear that to their, their re-election campaign. Uh, and it's going to take all on all hands on deck. I mean, if the Lincoln Project is going to take their contacts and their money and their anger and their ability to skirt the charge of tone policing mm-hmm. uh, to win back the Senate and win a solid Senate majority for a President Biden, mm-hmm. go for it. Well, uh, but I don't trust them. No. Well, <laughs> and, and we- I won't let them have a seat at the table of a Biden administration without a huge fight. And if we had not already been through this many, many times right. before, the last yeah. time with the fucking fake Tea Party, where yeah. we're yeah. all going to end. I mean, even Obama finally admitted that he made a huge mistake in pretending that the Republican Party could be reasoned with in any way. Yeah, eventually the fever will break. Will yes. Break. No. No, it won't. It's a fever all the way down. There's nothing it's there a, but And it's fever. a fever that is continually fed by Fox News and yeah. hate radio. Yeah. Well, and, and my concern is twofold. One is that I'm just generally pissed off when I tune into, you know, a prominent conservative podcast run by these people. And the last three in the row, in the row, there have always been a moment taken out to say, you know, those people who are now like trying to get out of the Trump administration, like, oh, we, we, oh, if only someone had warned them, only if someone had told them it was going to be bad. Oh, those fucking people. Like, you know what? Those people are you. You are the people who were warned all this time that your party was heading in this direction and you didn't fucking listen. And now you'd like to take the moral high ground. You'd like to be the people who look down your nose at people who want to jump off the ship just as it's sinking rather than jump off the ship two years ago or three years ago. It was plainly obvious what was happening. And as long as you control the cameras and the microphones and you're friends with Joe Scarborough and you can hog your way into every op-ed page in the country, you're going to get away with it. The second thing that concerns me is, I, I know I read this last week, but it fits in very well here. This is one of several posts several tweets by Lincoln Project members in the last week. One was Steve Schmidt. This is one by Stuart Stevens. Um, I expect this post, I expected this post November 3rd, the last 24 hours hearing from some prominent Republicans supporting Trump and one top Trump staffer asking how best to find the exit ramp. My answer is simple. Never too early or too late to do the right thing. How it's done won't matter after it's done. That's what they're shooting for. The These people are setting themselves up as the dispensers of dispensation. Mm-hmm. They're the ones who will grant forgiveness to those who are good and come on their project. And those who are bad are going to be cast into the wilderness. Now, these people are the fucking Republican Party. They right. have no business absolving these people on my behalf. These people are the people who helped break my country. The well, people, and, and particularly on the behalf of the two hundred and ten thousand people who died of COVID yes. this year. Yes, right. Oh well, we'll forgive you, even though you worked for Trump up until October of twenty twenty. But you but, get to come and join the Lincoln Project now, as long as you do it now, and, sure. and your sins will be forgiven. In fact, they'll be forgotten before they're ever forgiven. So right. if you if you want to know what the future looks like, it is Steve Schmidt and. Charlie Sykes and Bill Kristol, who are now the new center of American politics, the reasonable center between the extremes We're on the left and the extremes on the right. We're a center-right center country, We're a center-right country. Yeah. Um, yeah. Celebrated on all your cable news shows, permanently embedded in every news media you see, all with the collective message that the extremes on the left and the extremes on the right are really the problem. 
and with the power to absolve the sins of those who followed Trump into this very dark place because they just didn't know what they were doing or they wanted tax cuts or they wanted to disrupt the system, which is understandable because the system is so corrupt. That's the future you are buying if you accept these people as your saviors. Drift Glass, I want to do a shout out to a relatively new Twitter account that I discovered this week. I want to thank the person that brought this to my attention. Oh, yes. At both sides, though, (laughs) T-H-O. Awesome. Uh, They're they're taking uh, blue checks and people that have over 5,000 followers Uh who uh, do this both-siderism nonsense Uh and uh, just taking them right down, and I really appreciate it. Um, And you have an excellent example from Dean Beckett of the New York Times. Yes, Dean Beckett, who's the executive editor of the New York Times, (sighs) who cannot fucking help himself. Uh, This is a quote. during the interview he was doing, and and he acknowledges that the Trump is bad and the you know, Republican Party is problematic. But this is on the role of fact-checking. Um, the role of fact-checking, for example, has never been more prominent. Take CNN's Daniel Dale's meteoric rise chronicling Trump's thousands of lies and falsehoods going from Washington Bureau chief at the Toronto Star to a regular on Anderson Cooper's primetime show. Quote, some of the things we learned to do in the Trump era should not go away, Backett said. If I'm CNN, if there's a transition, I'm going to sit down with Daniel Dale and say, this was great. Let's be just as aggressive on a Democratic administration. Right. Let's make sure we really fact check the Democrats. Yeah, because you know how those Democrats are. Sometimes they've got pneumonia. (laughs) They're going to be just as bad. You know, sometimes they got emails (laughs) and sometimes they're sick. And and I'm I'm sitting there in my mind's eye. I'm having this weird... Um, please, please remember Dean Beckett being editor of the New York Times when the email stories had headlines on page one above the fold. No, 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 not fair. Not, again, no fair remembering stuff. No, I, uh-huh. I, I have this disorienting vision in my mind of of David Brooks castigating Barack Obama for not being centristy enough. Right. And I forget who it was um, doing a point by point takedown. Go, wait a minute. David Brooks is castigating Barack Obama over stuff Barack Obama is actually doing. Mm-hmm. He's having to make up imaginary things that Barack Obama isn't doing, even though he's literally doing them right now, to to come up with some reason why both sides are to blame. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. was under Dean Beckett's, you know, tutelage. Absolutely, yeah. They they will, yep. and honestly, you take all Trump's lies, all twenty thousand, thirty thousand of them. That they're lethal, literally lethal. They're toxic. They're horrifying. You put them in a box. On one side of the scale, you put all the both sides do it bullshit in another box on the other side of the scale, and the both sides do it wins, hands down. Because without the enabling lie, the giant enabling lie that the mainstream media pitches every fucking day, that both sides are to blame, and both sides are at fault, and both sides need to be watched very equally carefully. And then they just lie about it when it turns out to be wrong. Without that enabling permission structure, Donald Trump isn't even possible. Right. Because at right. some point in the last, I don't know, 30 years, some honest news person would have said, wait a minute, there's a fascist moving gro- movement growing inside the Republican Party. Maybe we should cover that as, you know, news. But no, there the are only the only person that did that was on Comedy Central. I know. Isn't that isn't that um, perfect? Yeah, <laughs> That's the perfect summary. I want to do I want to do news roundup starting with the vice presidential debate. Well, the vice presidential debate should never have happened. Um, Mike Pence should be in quarantine right now, this minute. He was exposed to a super spreader at super spreader events. And every CDC guideline says this guy should not be out in public at all. Under any circumstances, he should be locked down for the next two weeks until he either shows symptoms or does not. But that is how the public health officials in this country, um, uh, the rules that they've set in, in the public interest. And Mike Pence. And he was symptomatic at the debate. Yes. He had pink eye. And he had a fly on his head. So, you know. <laughs> um, but he just said, like Trump, like his boss, like his lord and master, he just said, fuck it. I don't care. And he went out there to do what he was there to do. And that's that said, both candidates did what they were sent there to do. Kamala Harris advanced the Biden-Harris agenda. Uh, she was in command of the facts. She was very forceful, but polite. She had to skate right down that Barack Obama, be forceful, but don't be angry because you're a black person, especially a woman. You can't be that in public. 
did that perfectly and reminded the audience that was watching that Trump is trying to take away their health care from 20 million Americans. She called the Trump administration's handling of the coronavirus pandemic, quote, the greatest failure of any presidential administration in the history of our country, saying this administration has forfeited their right to re-election due to its ineptitude and incompetence. She added, they knew what was happening and they didn't tell you. She was great. On the other hand, Mike Pence was there for a totally different reason. He was deployed as a slab of boring, vanilla denialism and human flypaper. Let's let's face it. That's part, part of the reason he was there. He was there to interrupt the moderator, interrupt Senator Harris, and generally pretend that Donald Trump does not exist, which might have worked. If the very next day Donald Trump hadn't gone on Fox and repeatedly bellowed that Kamala Harris is a dirty communist monster who wants to destroy America. And that undid any trifling good that Mike Pence might have done for his campaign. Because you can't keep pretending the monster isn't there when the monster is the, on the rooftop screaming insanity 24-7. Yeah, and, and that's the, biggest, the biggest problem of the Trump campaign is they have a candidate who opens his mouth. Yeah, yeah. it really is a huge problem. Uh, I also agree with Joanne Reed, who said, you know, the purpose of Pence used to be to calm down suburban women. Right. And to make them think, OK, but, you know, Pence is a nice Christian man and right. he's in my comfort zone of being of suburbia, you know. Black people aren't going to burn down my suburbs if Mike Pence is there to keep Trump's nastiness in check. Right. Because we know that Pence is a good Christian man. Mm -hmm. and, and Mike Pence interrupted Kamala Harris so many times and was such a brute uh, that that turns women off. He did not, I don't think, go there accomplishing what he was supposed to accomplish. Because he did interrupt her to the extent that every woman recognizes that guy in a meeting, yeah. in a in an organization, in at the job. You 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 saw her and the celebration of Kamala Harris saying, I'm speaking, spoke much more directly to suburban women and working women than Mike Pence was able to do. Well, and and back in, I think it was 92, 91, 92, um, some very clever person described George H.W. Bush as every woman's first husband. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Mike Pence was every woman's first husband's creepy friend who <laughs> might actually have bodies buried in the backyard. Yeah. Um, yeah. And who just wants to get you alone and talk to you about the Lord. <laughs> um, that's not working. And, but yeah. the thing is they have no cards to play. There's nothing for them to talk about. And that's why. Oh, debates... no, they were. That's why Fox was talking about Hillary's emails this right. week. Well, that's why Donald Trump is talking about arresting Hillary Clinton. Yeah. In, in the same rambling deranged Fox news interview, uh, mm -hmm. if you can call it that, that he was screaming about, uh, Kamala Harris being a dirty communist monster. Uh, he he was talking about how his political opponents conspired against him. He demanded that Bill Barr indict Biden and Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton for unspecified crimes. And he claimed that I'm back because I'm a perfect physical specimen and I'm extremely young. And it's like, oh, <laughs> OK, that's, you know, when Adderall meets steroids, that's the weirdness that comes out and meets racism. That's what comes out of the mouth. Well, and, and let's be clear, too, mm -hmm. that. That statement of, you know, where are my arrests? Where where are right. the arrests that were supposed to happen is a QAnon thing. Yes. Because on Thursday, that was supposed to be the day that Q predicted that Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden would be arrested by the end of the day today. Right. The dragnet would drop. Yeah. 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 You know, and so this is what Trump was reading on his Twitter yeah, uh, you know, it's okay. It's okay, Mr. President. Your enemies are about to be vanquished within the next 12 hours. Yes. Well, so and, he and wants to know, where is it? Where are my arrests? And and <laughs> this is the week, I, it might have happened earlier, but this is the week that Donald Trump has become the thing that wouldn't leave. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the guest that won't go away. This is This is the time when... Every time he's on radio or television, he just rambles and rambles until the hosts say, well, we know you're very busy running important things and experimenting with drugs and saving the country. So how about next time? And he just keeps talking and talking like, 
I, I don't know who said it on Twitter, but I repeated it. I wish I were president of the United States so I would have all the spare time in the world to do whatever the fuck I wanted. And they just give him a microphone and let him talk and the most deranged shit comes pouring out because they have nothing left. There's no other cards to play. This is their candidate. And they can't shut him up and they can't shut him down. And it is he is incredibly stupid and feral and racist and deranged. And Mike Pence is just really dumb. I mean, one of the things you realize when Mike Pence is given a microphone is how incredibly stupid, just bone stupid, Mike Pence really is. That's why he's a failed governor of a small Midwestern state who is about to lose his job forever before he was dragged off the ash heap of history and made vice president to the worst president in history. And that's his legacy forever. And I don't know. It's, 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 if it were just a matter of regime change, I'd be sanguine about that. If it were just a matter of the top 50 people have to go. But it's right. not. It's the whole fucking party. And here's an example. <laughs> Republican Senator Mike Lee today yeah. said the quiet part out loud. He said, and I quote, democracy isn't the objective. Liberty, peace, and prosperity are. We want the human condition to flourish. Rank democracy can thwart that. By rank democracy, he means black and brown people voting. He means everybody voting. Well, yeah, right. Dem- but he's right. specifically, Universal suffrage. Right. Specifically, they hate minorities. They right. can always find some and women. Who, oh yeah, and well, young people. Yeah, and, I mean anyone who's not voting for liberty, peace, and prosperity yeah. with an R after its name, right? Well, and, and this is, but this is an academic philosophy. This isn't just Mike Lee spouting this out no. of his ass. Again, this is a thing that right wingers in in certain academic cells believe is well, that. The- Voting should be for elite men, educated elite men who are conservative. That's how you per- that's how you pursue economic prosperity in America is Christian white men functioning as the gatekeepers of leadership. Well, and this is Paul Weirich, you know, mm-hmm, Republican mm-hmm. strategist from way back saying, I yeah. don't want everyone to vote. We right. lose when everyone votes. I want only our people to vote. Republicans, I, and I've said this before, they and I really hate this country. They really hate this country. They, <laughs> yes. I'm not kidding. Republicans and conservatives despise this country. And that's why they're delighted with the thought of it burning to the ground. Because then they mm-hmm. will, like Charlie Manson, you know, rise out of the pit with their followers and take the place over. They want a race war so they can take over the ruins after all the bad people are gone and become, you know, kings of the world. And this is what they dream of. This is what they believe. And it doesn't matter how deep into the party structure you go, down past consultants, down past organizers, bundlers, local chieftains, down to the voters. They're all this way, or they wouldn't be in that party. So it isn't enough to get rid of the top five people or 50 people or 500 people. The whole party has to go. Now, I don't have the power to do that. Neither do you. But it is important that at the top of our minds, very much like climate change, every democratic strategy to save this country from these monsters has to be – this party has to be isolated and sequestered. Eliminated as and el- a political power. And, and, yeah, like, and as neutered. it has been in California. Yeah. And that's the model. Yeah. yeah. Shrink it. And shrink it structurally. Get rid of the electoral college. Mm-hmm. Get rid of the filibuster. And really start to work toward racial justice because all of these things that are keeping Republican Republicans in power is fucking racist. Well, and if you'd like the power structure that keeps the people who are the both siders in place, if you'd like that power structure knocked over because the both sides do what lie is the big lie. Mm-hmm. Let me repeat. There are people on the left who are really good at making scathing arguments and observations and critiques of that structure. Can do it mm-hmm. on camera, can do it on microphone, can do it in writing and have been doing it for decades. And they're called liberal bloggers. And it doesn't bloggers. have to be me and it doesn't have no. to be you. There's lots of other people no, out there doing absolutely it. absolutely not. Yes. But, you know, but you have to stop writing checks to the Lincoln Project, Rob Reiner, and start writing checks to Digby. Right. <laughs> you have to start putting people like that in the front of your movement because we're perfectly capable of taking on, give me two minutes alone or on camera with David Brooks and receipts and I will make him a whimpering, crying child pooping himself and running away and never doing it again. Put me in front of Joe Scarborough for a minute. I can make him Mm -hmm. look like an ass. It's not hard to do because we have the receipts. It's that the people who own the media desperately don't want us there. 
So right. we have to have our tr- our team, our tribe, our folks backing us to become big enough to do that sort of thing over the objections of people who would stop us. Well, and the question then becomes how many of those people are going to retire before 2022? I'm going to be very interested to see. Continue our news roundup. Today, Rush Limbaugh and Donald Trump spent two hours in each other's arms, wallowing in deranged conspiracies and but her emails whining. Trump said, fuck around about Iran. They can't fuck around, likely prompting an FCC fine on Rush Bow. Uh, during a Fox News interview, Trump claimed that Ralph Northam personally, quote, executed a baby. People who are shocked by this kind of blood libel incitement from a Republican should Google Bill O'Reilly and Taylor the Baby Killer or Carly Fiorina's entire 2016 presidential campaign. Also, Marsha Blackburn. Marsha Blackburn, baby parts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. House Democrats will create a commission to review whether Trump is capable of carrying out his duties as president. The, I watched the entire press conference today, and it was a perfect troll of Trump. This is about the lame duck session. Yes. No matter what, I don't care what Nancy Pelosi is saying about this being about the next term. Mm-hmm. What she really means is we're setting this up. And we're, it, it's one stone in the road toward preventing Trump, another Trump from ever happening. Mm-hmm. It's the first stone. It's one of many that have to go into place. Uh, but there needs to be a medical commission because the cabinet won't do it. Uh, This week, a desperate attention whore trying to claw her way back into Fox News, Megyn Kelly, told Kamala Harris to take it like a woman. Don't make faces. Ironically, this is probably exactly what deceased sexual predator Roger Ailes told Megyn Kelly when she was in his office interviewing for a, quote, job, unquote. Mm. (laughs) The Notre Dame faculty commenting on Trump's super spreader event in the Rose Garden ceremony. The decision not to wear a mask stemmed not from politics, but from a desire to politely blend in as a guest at a cocktail party might remove a tie upon realizing everyone else was dressed in business casual. And so the president of Notre Dame tested positive for COVID. (laughs) Mask of the Red Death. Um, This week, Trump is hyping Regeneron, claiming, quote, Hundreds of thousands of vials are being sent to hospitals all over the country. People are going to get better. The press doesn't want to report that. There is absolutely no proof that any of this is true. There is proof that the owner of the company that makes Regeneron is a member of Trump's golf club. And that is likely that Trump is an investor in that company. Uh, There are currently more COVID cases at the White House than in the entire nation of New Zealand. Speaking of the Trump White House, Trump refused to participate in the next presidential debate after the Bipartisan Commission on Presidential Debates announced it would be held held virtually due to coronavirus concerns. Trump tried to blame his COVID-19 on Gold Star family members, despite the veterans group involved in organizing the event, confirming all attendees tested negative before the ceremony and all of them are doing well and exhibit no symptoms of COVID-19. Donald Trump demanded Congress pass a new coronavirus uh, stimulus package hours after Donald Trump abruptly ordered his negotiators to stop talks with Democrats until after the election. The Trump administration refused to allow the CDC to do contract tracing at the White House. Um, Let that sink in. Yeah, well, they don't want to know who's fucking who. Yeah, they know the details of exactly when Trump contracted COVID and how many people he knowingly put at risk will come out if they do contract tracing. Yes. Uh, In case you were wondering about that batshit Bundy family, uh, they're keeping busy. Uh, This is from KBTV in Boise, Idaho. Um, A high school football game was forced to end at the halftime after Eamon Bundy refused to wear a mask or leave. The Emmett Huskies led the Caldwell Cougars 35-0 to zero at half before the game was forced to end because Bundy refused to wear a mask or leave school property. And on Fox News this week, uh, a commenter was allowed to say, and she's from the New York Post, which is another uh, Rupert Murdoch property, it's incredibly selfish of older people or neurotic people who are timid and afraid and won't come out of their basements to confine children and young people to miss out on the most important part of their lives due to COVID. This is from the caging children people. 
Yeah. Well, and and you know that Rupert Murdoch is social distancing and wearing masks whenever he has to meet with somebody. He's living in a hermetically sealed bubble. Yes, of course he is. Taking his nutrition through a straw that's been, you know, boiled three times. Because he's not stupid. He's old. He's He's got every comorbidity you can think of. Right. We love you guys. Send us letters for Drift Glass's birthday. Yes. And in three weeks on October 30th, we're going to have a letter show. And I, I thought about... The fact that we have had letter shows in the past on Thanksgiving weekend, but I think we need to sort of encapsulate this moment in time. Yeah, yeah, we do. <laughs> and and talk to one another right before the election. So please write us. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is our own cat, Bosco. Bosco, he's not from Moscow. <laughs> And oh God, Bosco loves freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. <laughs> oh, he's the most vocal cat we've ever, I have ever owned. Yeah. Just comes in and shouts at you. <laughs> Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store direct, your cat will sit on the kitchen floor and demand <laughs> that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And I'm singing that a little quietly because yes. Bosco is in the next room and he will run over and start shouting at me. <laughs> Here's the song. <laughs> and uh, Bosco dies a lot. He spreads out on his back with his paws up and his eyes closed as if he's, you know, playing possum. He collapses a lot. You he might just say. collapses. Yeah. Yes. And so we have a picture of that on our Facebook page and website. Mm-hmm. And you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, as you might have noticed, we're running a little low on kitties, so we <laughs> dug into our own stash. But uh, So feel free to write us. And if, if you've sent an internet kitty in the past and we haven't made them internet kitty yet, let me know that in your email because we'll put you to the top of the list. Uh, and do, again, feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service, Go Postal Unions, letter on the air, unless you say otherwise, hashtag save the post office, Go Postal Unions. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job, and it's a labor of love, and we do love all of you. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution. Uh, five bucks makes a difference. You can send it in to us. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Our PayPal postal address information, it's all there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties sincerely hope that there are no more debates with Donald Trump forever and ever Amen. Amen. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, lovey dovey. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2019-2020, DGBG Productions.